interesting to be back aboard Messenger 3 and reminisce times in this galley, times tied up at the floats. I'm thinking of Percy and Harold, the two men I came aboard with, uh, the personification of the Christian faith. Never ever had met two men quite like they. Well, there was a Messenger 1 not a lot of is known of that small vessel because it was a temporary vessel serving the purpose until Messenger 2 came into the picture. It was a, a sturdy craft, about 36 feet, a little cabin cruiser that served the coast very, very well until the days Messenger 3 was built, 1947. Messenger 2 was then given to the Esperanza General Hospital under NIT commission. Well, it was built by Shantyman in Victoria, in one of the shipyards in Victoria. And when the keel was laid, uh, there was a brass plaque put on the keel of the messenger. It is now fixed to the interior of the wheelhouse. 
the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will not fail thee, nor will he forsake thee. That was back in 1947. The ship was completed. It was towed to Nanaimo for the installation of twin Chrysler Crown gasoline engines by Johnny Rowan in Nanaimo. And there in, I believe, the fall of 1947, uh, it had its maiden voyage in the Gulf Islands. It's interesting, back in at the turn of the century, clergy in the Toronto area went into Perry Sound where loggers lived in shake dwellings, shake shanties. They were called shantymen loggers and they named the clergy shanty boys. So at the turn of the century when it was decided to form a dominion-wide work to reach backwoods areas, miners, road construction, railway men. They rather proudly took the term shanty boys or shanty men's Christian Association of North America. And uh, from those days to the present, our men still hike the trails, knock on doors in uh, remote areas. That was the uh, joy of my life to spend my time on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Shantymen across Canada uh, had, a, had committees in those days, regional committees, and there was a Vancouver Island branch of Shantymen's Christian Association. That branch under the, the direction of Percy Wills, our senior missionary, and the committee in Victoria took responsibility for all the funding the raising of funds for all of Victoria or Vancouver Island Shantyman work. In those days, uh, I was in Tofino. My first week with Shantyman. It was May of 1952, and I was waiting to have an opportunity to board the messenger. I the time was the time came. I received a call from the skipper of the boat to meet him in a place called Dodgers Cove in the Deer Group of Barclay Sound. So I boarded the Cooperator 4 out of Tofino to make my way down to Dodgers Cove. And I recall stepping aboard the messenger and at this very same spot sat my old Bible college friend Don McLean. We were both young men, of course. Skipper Harold Peters was aboard and his partner for that year, his shipmate, was Don McLean, the doctor's son. Don was about to leave for Japan as a missionary, and I was his replacement on the messenger. Uh, very, very foggy day. That was an interesting experience for me. I was brought up in Saskatchewan, and uh, I was about to learn the ropes and become a, a young man of the sea. I came into Dodgers Cove in a very, very heavy fog, and uh, it was very, very interesting to uh, be in the wheelhouse of the Cooperator 4 and watch the skipper bring his vessel through the rocks and reefs and into a little quiet, safe harbor. I had met Harold Peters before, but uh, I knew the moment I stepped aboard that this was to be my home and my life. <clears throat> thing that impressed me most about Percy was... Uh, <clears throat> the active life of faith and trust in God. He was a man constantly full of praise, full of the Spirit, and it exuded from him in his expressions, in his smile, in his words. I think one of the most uh, impressive things about Percy was uh, his trust in young people uh, and the confidence he had in you. You felt it. You knew it. Percy was a wise, wise man. He knew how to bring young people up, bring them forward, bring them into the ministry. Uh, I remember saying to Percy one day, a young missionary, Percy, I would really appreciate it if you would give us a little more instruction. What would you like us to be doing? Where would you like us to be going? <laughs> With a twinkle in his eye and a smile, Percy would say, son, I want you to discover from God in your own heart what his directives are for you for the day, for the week. And that was about all he said. He wasn't wordy, but uh, when he spoke, 
you knew exactly what he had in mind, you knew exactly what he meant, and you knew his heart for you. And he wanted us as young men, yes, he wanted us to hear our seniors, but he wanted us to hear the Lord of the harvest. He wanted us to hear God in our hearts and know day to day what we needed to be doing. I'll never forget that about Percy. One of the very outstanding things about Percy was he was among uh, among the men, he was the greatest servant. He was always responding to need, whether it was to pick something up, whether it was to serve coffee, whether it was to do dishes, whether it was sweep the floor. <laughs> Harold, you know, one of the things I loved about Harold I didn't understand Harold when I was young. <laughs> I thought I knew I thought I knew a lot and I knew a little. If I said I knew nothing that would be that would be rather insulting to the staff and teachers at the Prairie Bible Institute, my parents, other mentors I'd had in life if I were to say I knew nothing when I came aboard. But uh, <clears throat> With gratitude to God for all of the mentors in my life, I stepped aboard to be associated with a man who was selfless, a very, very wonderful person, Harold. You know, in those early days, we were pulling into Tofino once, and Harold was grooming me uh, to one day become skipper of the vessel. And Harold said, where do you think we should tie up, Earl? And I thought quietly within my heart, come on, Captain, don't you know your own mind? <laughs> don't you know where you want to tie the vessel up? Why are you asking me where to tie it up? But he was just preparing my thought patterns, developing me, coming into harbor, beginning to think. All of the options, the tides, the winds. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I don't recall what eventually happened there, but I do remember that later in life I realized what Harold was up to. And I often thought Harold was indecisive. Uh, why, is, why is it this man can't make up his mind quickly, speedily? <laughs> I came to realize that he was, he had in mind the needs of everybody around him. And he wasn't about to make a decision until he was quite sure which decision would be best for everybody. A young man, I could make a split decision. <laughs> Might not be the best for many people around, but it was very wonderful having an opportunity to be with the old skipper. Um, strong man. You know, I learned a lot from all of the men I've worked with on the coast to the present. Now working with my own son, who is my leader on the coast, and the numbers of things that I have learned from Dean. But Harold and I were coming out of a home in Tofino once, and I had spoken at a turn. I have no idea what it was. I said something I shouldn't have said. And on the way down to the vessel, <laughs> the old skipper said to me, and I was probably 24 at that time, he said, Johnson, if you ever say that again, I'll flatten you. <laughs> I've always loved the old skipper. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Harold was honest. <laughs> when I needed to hear something, he told me. Well, a typical day uh, would begin uh, often determined by the weather. <clears throat> and the typical day for us uh, was... Uh, <clears throat> early, early in the morning, if the weather was good. And if the weather was foul, it was probably late, late at night that we would travel. Uh, we often travel through the night to take advantage of the, the quiet westerly winds and the calmer seas and make our trips along the exposed areas of the coast uh, in, in the calmer waters if we could. Uh, but a typical day would probably start for us about 6.30 in the morning. Uh, one of our shipmates would say, when asked who got breakfast or who got lunch, 
and Wilbur James, uh, engineer and wonderful partner aboard the messenger for many years, Wilbur and Barbara. Wilbur would chuckle and say, whoever got hungry, <laughs> or the one who couldn't hold on anymore. But we'd have uh, porridge, uh, usually a porridge breakfast and some toast. And then, uh, and that was often underway. If uh, the weather was good and we had some quiet waters to travel, we'd get up, warm the engine up, and we'd be underway and then eat as we journeyed. <clears throat> of course, it would depend on the area we were in. If we happened to be in a community with numbers of, of homes, we would begin at a, probably an early hour, 8.30 in the morning, begin knocking on doors. And that would go on until maybe 10.30 or 11 at night. Uh, lunch or coffee in this home or a bite to eat in that home and uh, return to the messenger sometime late in the evening. Uh, there really wasn't a typical day. Some vessels operate that way, 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, but ours, <clears throat> ours was determined by the needs of the people in the community, by the weather, and we never had a schedule that suited ourselves. Shanty Boys didn't operate that way. <clears throat> we tied in at Gabriel Island once, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the skipper said to me, Earl, you can uh, walk the, the road and the trail for about two miles around to Degnan Harbor, and I'll be there late in the evening, and you can board the vessel there. <clears throat> so I began knocking on doors. I had a little bundle of shantyman papers with me. It came to the end of the evening. <clears throat> it was about 10 o'clock. It was still a bit light out, and I thought, well, there's only one more home here. I'm going to risk knocking this late at night. An old guy came to the door. He was much older than I. He wasn't very old, probably. He was maybe in his 40s, maybe 50. And I said to him, having the paper in my hand, I said, I'm a shantyman. Uh, we're visiting the island. I'm walking the trail here. Noticed your home, so I thought I would come in and say hello. He looked at me and he said, you can come in, but leave your religion outside. As I stepped in the door, in my heart, I had the awareness that we were called to love people, not to preach something, not to try fulfill an agenda we had, but just go among the people and love them as Christ loved them. I had a funeral not long ago. <clears throat> there were about a dozen of us in the room talking about the funeral. And there was one member of the family, a little, little, just a little bit, uh, some people would say wing-ding, short a couple of bricks. <laughs> and all of a sudden, in the quietness of the moment, he spoke up and said, uh, how's your love life, Earl? And instantly I responded, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful, out of this world. I love him better every day. I love him better every day. Close by his side, I will abide. I love him better every day. Hallelujah. Not another word was spoken. <laughs> you know, I was entering <clears throat> in the logging camps. I took occasion to use a, use a ploy. Often there was a little coffee bar by the card room or by a billiard room or by a little area where we could hold a service with the men. <clears throat> and prior to the service, I'd sit at the coffee counter. I'd glance at the guys sitting there, and I would pick the one that I thought may be the, the weakest among them. And I would position myself so that my left hand was going to be next to his uh, would be his left hand. <clears throat> and we coffeeed together, and I'd say, I'm going to have a service in a few minutes uh, in the little room next here. I'll make a wager with you. <clears throat> I'll twist, wi twist wrists with you. If I win, you come to my service. If you win, you don't have to. <laughs> By this time, all the guys around were listening and enjoying this. And of course, he couldn't back down 
with a challenge like that. He was a logger and I was just a young minister. So he'd put his left hand up there and I'd put my left hand up. I had a powerful left hand in those days. <laughs> I boxed as a boy and I was into sports activities. I worked in the lumber mills ages 17 through 20. Heavy, heavy work. And I think I had, over the period of my experience in the coast, about four guys that came to services <laughs> rather reluctantly. <clears throat> we often had our readings as we journeyed. And the three of us, Percy, Harold, myself, we'd be in the wheelhouse having our reading. We had a big book. Um, it was uh, like one of those very, very old and large Bibles. It was four inches thick, probably 10 by 12 inches, very, very large, had a daily reading, morning and evening, a scripture, a thought, a poem, and uh, we would often read and sing together. The wheelhouse was full of music. Uh, the praises of God were, uh, Harold, I think, was most responsible for that. He loved to sing, and he was a good singer. And even in his late 80s, he, he compared himself with George Beverly Shea, just in fun. Well, he would listen to Beverly Shea and sing along with George Beverly Shea. And his voice was of a quality that compared to Beverly Shea. Harold had a wonderful baritone voice. But we sang in the wheelhouse. Uh, often we would sing in the wheelhouse, and we would pray together over the difficult situations in the communities that we were going to. I recall once we knelt on the wheel out on the galley floor. And that's something that really impressed me with our men. McLean, Wills, Peters, they always knelt to pray. My heart was always among the people of the coast and it was always a a delight to step aboard again and move out to people we had met, like Race Rock's Lighthouse. Uh, so many stories about the coast. But a funny thing comes to my mind. The only time I didn't want to board the messenger <laughs> was in Victoria <clears throat> when I had to say goodbye to Louise. <laughs> I was courting this young nurse at the Royal Jubilee Hospital, Louise McPherson. And the only time I was a little reluctant to step aboard and return to my duties was when I had to say goodbye to Louise. <laughs> but uh, on one of those occasions, uh, we went to uh, Race Rock's Lighthouse. Uh, it was a very, very stormy time. Uh, I had left Louise, I believe, in Victoria. We were married at the time. Wilbur and Barbara James were my partners, and Barbara was not aboard either. Wilbur and I were alone. We anchored at Race Rocks, and it was a nasty, nasty day. Riptides were bad, the wind was strong, and I had Wilbur take me in very, very close to the rocks, and I went ashore in the dinghy. Wilbur went out and anchored the vessel, tried to anchor in a relatively calm spot, <clears throat> unknown to me, while I was ashore, we lost two anchors. The North Hill, in a sharp, sharp pull of the anchor chain, the fluke snapped off. He pulled that anchor in and dropped a huge Navy anchor that we had. We lost a fluke off it as well. I think that's one day our beloved Percy wasn't too happy with his young seaman. <laughs> a couple of hundred dollars. <clears throat> that day we however Percy really never concerned himself too much with that he knew we had to learn and he knew that things more important were happening this particular day <clears throat> I went ashore I hadn't met the keeper and his wife my first visit since their arrival I hadn't been in their presence long and I said to Kurt how are you folks doing? His wife, Erica, was standing at the kitchen sink. She leaned against the sink and began to cry, just cry uncontrollably. Kurt continued the story. 
<clears throat> how that they were immigrants, second class students, or immigrants, second class individuals, uh, assistants at the light, and relationships with the head keeper were not pleasant at all, and they didn't know what to do. I had two hours with Kurt and Erica, and I remember as though it were yesterday, we talked of the ability that we've been given as human beings to adapt and adjust to difficult situations so that the unbearable can almost be pleasant if we look at life correctly. I had prayer with the young couple and then went to visit the keeper. I have no recollection of my time with the keeper and his wife, but being young in those days and pretty straightforward, I'm sure that I came at the situation, though rather obliquely, sort of a glancing touch of it. Three months after that visit, I had a most wonderful letter from Kurt Seahack. And in his letter he said, We don't know what happened that day you were at the light, but something wonderful happened. It was pure pleasure ever since. Well, I cherish that as a young man. You're on the coast among the people, hopefully, to bring blessing. And when you experience something of that nature and know about it, you hold on to it and give thanks to God for his grace. Well, do you know, <clears throat> there's a sequel. If you have a moment, there's a sequel to that story. At age 65, I decided to bungee jump at Nanaimo just for a, just for a little challenge. And I had arranged with the engineer aboard the Dayliner. The Dayliner's custom was to stop at the railway bridge, just adjacent to the bungee bridge and lower than the bungee bridge. They would stop momentarily on the railway bridge and watch one or two jump. Well, I had arranged my time, my jump was synchronized with the time the train would be there. I heard the train in the offing blowing his whistle, and I thought, oh, why did you decide this? I'm standing there with my toes over the edge. The train has stopped, and I had arranged to wave at the engineer. He would blow his whistle. That was a sign to my 70 friends there. Watch the bridge. He's going. So the whistle blew, and I dropped. Well, you know, 10 days later, I was in Vancouver, and I got a call. And the fellow said, Earl, this is Kurt Sehack. I don't think you'll remember me. I said, Kurt, I could never forget you. He said, how come? We only met once in our life for two hours, 34 years ago. And I said, well, Kurt, I enjoyed that afternoon with you and Erica, and I've never forgotten it. He said, well, can you believe we were on the dayliner the day you bungee jumped? And the engineer came into the coach and said, a minister is going off there in a few minutes. His name is Earl Johnson. And I said to Erica, I wonder if that's the Earl Johnson we met. <laughs> he said, I have sent a donation to Shantyman to help cover that Pelton wheel you're putting in at Esperanza. Well, I was only going to jump for fun. Someone said, Earl, why don't you jump for a charity? And without thinking long, I said, well, I've got a good charity to jump for. So some of my friends put out a letter, and uh, in that uh, one or two minute experience, dropping from the bridge, we raised $13,000 <laughs> to help put the Pelton wheel in. Uh, we started, of course, at Victoria and uh, made our way north. We'd, uh, as a rule, we would work our way right up to Cape Scott and then begin the journey back. In those days, we were away from our families a lot. Twin Chryslers, gasoline, cost of fuel. We'd make our way up the coast and then we'd make our way down and we'd visit when we got back. Uh, it's a long journey in a lot of communities. Four large bodies of water indenting the west coast Barkley Sound, Clackwood Sound, Nootka, Cayucat, Quatsino, five, five sounds. <clears throat> Our first stop was a leper colony, 
at the south end of Vancouver Island, very close to Race Rocks Lighthouse. It was always a pleasure going in and, and talking with the lepers and visiting with them, and then the lighthouse. And then from there, we, uh, in my day, we never went into Beach or Bay. That was accessible by land and roads. And we'd go into Sioux Harbor and visit there, and then on up to, uh, to uh, Sheringham Light, <clears throat> and then from there to Jordan River, which was also accessible by road, and there was no anchorage, really. We'd go on into, into Port Renfrew, <clears throat> And from Port Renfrew, we'd go north to Carmana Light and Klaus and the Nitnat Lake. That was a tricky uh, entrance into the Nitnat Lake. And then next stop would be Pachina Light. <clears throat> and from Pachina on up to Cape Beale. Cape Beale then into Barclay Sound, Bamfield, Eucalyptus, Port Alberni, and a few islanders in there. E. Cool, Kildonan logging camps, small villages, and that could take two or three weeks in Barclay Sound, and then you wouldn't be really doing it the way you wanted to. And we'd go on up to Tofino, Clackwood Sound, and in Clackwood Sound uh, you have Tofino, Opetsit Village, a house it, uh, Riley's Cove in the early days where the George Ray Arthur family, he kept the telephone line to Fino to Estevan. Uh, Hot Springs Cove where the Ivan Clark family lived, Fish Buyer, Post Office, Justice of the Peace, all of those things which now <coughs> his son Huey is at the Ahousett General Store. We know Huey, knew Huey as a, a young man. <coughs> And then, of course, leaving that area into Boat Basin, where Cougarani lived, the Heshquit people, Estevan Point Lighthouse, and then around to Nootka Light, <clears throat> the Nootka Friendly Cove, Mushalit people, and the uh, Mauichets, <clears throat> and then Nootka Cannery where buildings were later taken to Esperanza to become part of that community. And then Nootka Sound, filled with logging camps, <coughs> Tassus, Abalus, <coughs> Esperanza Hospital. We would stop there, of course, and be a part of that. On up into Cayucat Sound, Shamus Bay, logging camps, the Cayucat people, the Cayucat Band, <coughs> the non-Indian population of the area. There wasn't much in north of Cayucat in Clashkish, Nisparty Inlet, those areas, until you then came around Cape Cook up to Winter Harbor. And there was quite a settlement in Winter Harbor, fishing community, a small reserve, Keynes Island Lighthouse, and uh, then on up into Quatsino Sound, very large area. We held youth camps up in that area, Coal Harbor, Holberg Air Base, Port Alice, Mahatta River, June Landing, and numerous small logging camps. Quatsino, uh, one of the most, uh, one of the oldest communities on the west coast, Quatsino, the Quatsino Reserve, and then up to Cape Scott, to the lighthouse. Well, there were the people in industry, of course, the fishermen. We spent a lot of time aboard vessels. Uh, when we'd tie in among them, uh, we'd visit the boats. And then in the early days, and I wasn't really involved in this, it was before my time, but McLean and Wills were in the mines of Zabellus. So there were the miners, and that was basically in the Zabellus area. Five active gold mines in those early days when McLean was there. The lumbermen, of course, that was the along with fishing, the primary industry. And then the First Nations villages, uh, that's uh, a part of the work that uh, that was such a, a joy to me. And uh, they became such close friends over the years. They were people who had time, people who welcomed you, people who loved you, people who serve you. Uh, very, very 
wonderful friendships formed in the villages of the coast. <clears throat> the recluses, they were very interesting people to visit. There was a little place called Sunshine Bay in Barclay Sound, near the, the old fish plant, Ikuo. And when my children were little, they were probably six years old, six, five, six, seven, I would take them one at a time, Nancy, Dean, or Diane, and I'd take them on a four-day trip out into Barclay Sound with me to visit these men in remote areas. And uh, they were very, very interesting. I remember one dear old guy, his name was Art. He was uh, known to take a shotgun at people if he didn't want them around. So I was ca cautious. I would be here at the wheel of the messenger, and as I went up, to the head of the little inlet where he was, his home on the starboard side, I would have my glasses on it just to see if there was any unusual activity. And uh, believe it or not, I actually knew how I would uh, retreat if necessary, put it in reverse, and uh, watch from a lowered position at the wheelhouse door how the messenger was backing out and I could come to the wheel and adjust it. Oh no, little things in my mind, unnecessary things, but you know how the mind works. <laughs> we had wonderful times uh, sharing the love of God with these dear people. And uh, one of the things that has been most interesting to us as shanty boys on the coast is watching the softening, the turning of hearts, and then the open confession of faith in God. And often that came over time, over a period of time. Always a delight to go into these people who so seldom had guests come to them or visitors come to them. Holding the wheel of the messenger here again and hanging on with my left hand to this support it reminds me of the times my fingers would get sore and my muscles tense hanging on for dear life in the wheelhouse as we went through some of those stormy seas. Uh, <clears throat> Wilbur and I were going around Cape Cook one day. <clears throat> it was uh, nine in the morning when we left the Esperanza Inlet, and gale warnings were posted for the west coast of Vancouver Island. And we were on our way, a six hour run to Quatsino Sound. We knew that if necessary, we could dodge in at Cayucat, three hours up, two and a half hours up. And uh, at noon, there was a, an old uh, manager of the Estevan radio station Robertson was his name. He gave the noon forecast and I spoke to him on our VHF and or not we did VHF side single sidebands in those days and I said your report sounds a little bit better this noon and I'll never forget his words he said remember he was an older man remember Mr. Johnson gale warnings are out <laughs> and uh, I'm afraid we were rather heedless in those days as young men, we decide to journey on. Well, we got to Cape Scott, Cape Cook, Cape Cook, 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was howling. And we had two and a half to three hours yet to go in darkness to Canes Island Light. I thought of turning to the starboard and into Clash Kish, a good anchorage if you knew how to get in there and if you could tell which was just the sea breaking and which was which were reefs breaking and I'd never been in Clash Kish. No one lived there. So I thought, no, no, that would be foolish to try to get in there. So we had no alternative. We had to go on to Winter Harbor. And uh, we couldn't hold the messenger on course. A big sea would come up on our starboard quarter and swing us to port and lay us in the trough and we'd wallow there until we could right the vessel again and get on course. Then a sea would catch the port quarter and swing us the other direction. Finally, we got to the lighthouse 
and I moved from the wheel back to the corner of the bunk where I had uh, my log book and the courses so that I had them all prearranged. <clears throat> I was standing there in the corner and a heavy sea hit us on the starboard side so hard, shook the vessel so much that it threw me backwards and my back went walloping against the wheelhouse door and the door flung open and I went out on deck and caught hold of the the cables that ran through our stanchions and I called to Wilbur, my partner, who had the wheel then. I said, Wilbur, I'm here. And he said, a good thing because I wouldn't be able to turn around in this. And it was black, dark, big seas. There's a four inch square brass uh, door fitting lock. It bent it from corner to corner and sprung the door open. Well, that was, that was, uh, that was pretty close. And uh, when we got into Mahatta River and tied up for the night, it was 8.30 at night. I said to Wilbur, let's just crawl in our bunks and get some rest. We'll clean this place up in the morning. We lost a hatch. We lost our fire buckets out of the bucket rack on the wheelhouse. Our lifeboat had shifted. Ballast had shifted. We had a we had a <laughs> an hour or so in the morning to tidy our vessel up. But <clears throat> through them all, we were safely safely guided. We brought a, a, a group of 30 aboard the messenger uh, from the Ahousat village up for this conference, and we encountered the, the biggest seas I've ever seen on the coast. Fortunately, the strong southeast gales had subsided, but the lump was there, and it was huge. I put a rope tightly strung from the engine room to the galley door so that people having to move through the galley could have something to hold on to all the time. I said to the men aboard, you're going to need to look after your families. I'm going to be at the wheel most of the time. And as we journeyed up, I was calculating the height of these seas. I had to kneel, not kneel, but bend my knees at the wheel to look out of the window and see the top of the sea away out there coming at us. So I said to the men, about eight or ten in the wheelhouse at the time, I said, what do you think the size of, of this these seas are? How high is this? And they looked at each other and, and one said, I think about 30 feet. And that's exactly what I had figured, 30 feet. That's a big, big sea. But it was wonderful how the messenger handled itself in there and we made it safely. I think the the, the nastiest, uh, I don't know if I should say scariest, I don't recall ever being frightened at, at sea. Uh, I had a, a little of it coming out of the, that lake. We'd been in the lake 10 days, gale warnings were out, and I didn't want to get uh, caught in the lake, held in the lake for another 10 days. So I decided to go out and as we came down the Nitnat Lake <clears throat> to uh, leave the lake, I, I saw, and it was a very interesting thing, it wasn't an apparition, it was a, a vision. I saw the Lord on the waters in front of us, and it brought calm to my heart. We stopped at the entrance to the lake, uh, on the lakeside, the entrance to the sea, and went up for dinner. We'd been invited to one of the uh, native homes at Wyack Reserve. We had dinner with them, and they called Carmana Light to get the local weather. Carmana said, Bert Pierce, the keeper, with his wife Mabel, Bert said, uh, there's a moderate sea and moderate wind here now. Bert phoned ahead to Beale, four hours up coast. And Beale said the same, moderate sea, moderate wind. We left the Nitnat. It's tricky going out over the Nitnat bar. You head out over the bar and the sea mounts up on the bar. And uh, I throttled down so the sea didn't come over us. And as soon as 
the sea went under, so I gave it full throttle again to get out over that bar before another breaker, a second breaker came, and the same procedure, slow down, go and speed up. And when I realized I was out over the bar, which may have had only eight feet of water on it at that time, and we draw six, sometimes boats go out and they crash down on the bar when the wave goes under, my knees were like rubber, really weak. But we headed up. <clears throat> we got off Pachina Light. It was dark. Three quarters of an hour yet to go to Cape Beale. And we, we, it was now howling, literally howling. And uh, we couldn't keep the boat on course. Again, it's just the sea's in charge. You'd like to be, but you're not. Uh, <clears throat> we got to Cape Beale and in around Cape Beale and out of that furious sea. I called the Lady Rose, Captain Dick McMinn was aboard that night, and Dick said, where are you Earl? And I said, we've just come around Beale. He said, what are you doing out there? It's blowing 80 miles an hour, and he was four miles from us. One experience I will never forget, we had taken Dr. McLean from Esperanza to Cayucat for his rounds. <clears throat> and we were anchored at Spring Island, a Loran station, just beside Walters Island, Cayucat. And uh, <clears throat> we were up visiting the Loran station. Dr. McLean was doing his medical rounds. And as his custom was, he'd have an evening service. And then we'd go back into Cayucat and tie up for the night. But there was a southeaster blowing. And Wilbur and I decided that we'd better go down and be aboard the boat. The anchorage isn't good, it's exposed, and reefs all around you. Not much leeway. I said to Dr. McLean, Doctor, when you come down at 10 or 10.30, if you think it's okay, bring Louise and Nancy. Nancy was in diapers, just a baby and Louise was enjoying a visit with one of the uh, one of the operator's wives, wife. And uh, McLean came down at 10 o'clock alone. I said to the doctor, we'll go back tomorrow and pick Louise up. Well, we went into Cayuca for the night, but about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock that night, we had a distress call from Esperanza. We need the doctor now. So we cut loose, headed out, and it was a nasty, nasty night. Again, we had very, very much difficulty trying to hold our life uh, boat aboard, lashing it down better. It, it, was, it was a sea you wouldn't want to be in. Do you know that it was 10 days before I could return to Spring Island and pick Louise and Nancy up? She was there with one diaper, but her hostess found soft towels and the like, and they had the most wonderful, wonderful visit. Louise was a person that everybody liked. The ladies would gather for tea and visits, and uh, this particular lady hadn't had uh, a, a house guest in 11 years, so you can be sure that it was a wonderful time, enjoyed by all, and one of God's ways of meeting people's needs. Uh, that's a night <laughs> I'll never forget. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock that cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love.